guys, I'm now trucking down the highway here with the Wilco Hess man. The Wilco without the Hess. I got my train strip heater with me. Now, those of you who followed my service videos a while back, I went and worked on a train unit. The, some of the one-time fuses were bad, so I was going to order a new heater. Some of you did say, hey, try to track down the one-time fuses, which looks out, that, that was probably the best possible plan because I just got the heater in. And you can go back and see when that video was, but it's been, oh, at least a month. So I'm going to put the heater in. Train is no longer making the heaters for these units because they're so obsolete being 10 years old and all. So they're going to sub it out to, I don't know who's making them, but just like all the other heaters are built by somebody else, now Train's having their heaters built by other people too. And evidently this is a new fad or they're not building that many of them because it took a long time to get it. So I'm on my way to Wilmington. I'm going to put this heater in and I'm probably never going to order another one for these type units again. Here we are back at the old TWE 040 E13 blah blah blah. Made 2006. You know, 2006 is in train. 2006 is obsolete. This is our train heater right here. We have our one Molex plug in the bottom there. We have some high voltage wiring coming in the top right here. We we'll have to remove that wiring, slide the new heater in, then replug the small plug in, rewire the high voltage, and we will be happy campers. So the next time they don't change your filters and everything gets burned up again. As you can see in these things, the high voltage is wire nutted in. I'm going to take these off, pull these out, and then put them back in after we get the new heater on. Remember guys, this is a system that had a very high static. You can see the mold on everything. Mold, because probably a lot of condensation because low airflow. That's what busted these one time fuses on the heat kit, the filters were dirty, air flows low, in the summer cycle you have a lot of condensation, a lot of mold growth, it's just nasty. And you can see just the disgusting nature, even the wiring has mold on it. So, not a, not a really good system, it's sort of a Mickey Mouse system. But, can't say the world, but I can change this here. This is our new heater. It's built by Warren. They build a lot of heaters for different manufacturers. We have DC relays on this one as well, like the carrier units, ironically. We have our two wires to wire in L1 and L2, two separated. Two wires go to L1, two wires go to L2, or vice versa. So we're going to wire this up. I already have plugged the plug in the bottom. It's open on both ends, unlike the train heater, so we can just bring the wire in right in the side. I'm going to go ahead and wire that up so we can get this thing back online. Okay guys, everything is wired up right here. I had to go with the giant wire. Now there's a lot of a lot of wires to bring together right there and they give you an extra one with this heat kit. Which makes it all the more cumbersome. So I'm about to put the lid back on here. Put the power back on there. And running and cooling for a few minutes and then test the heat strips as well. 7 amps. So our heater is working and functional. Which is great because it's brand new. So we're going to turn that off and turn it in cooling. We can test things out and make sure the charge is right before I leave. But our heater is in and functional. Guys, I have my return probe down there on the base box. I have my supply probe about midway up. Same one I use for heating purposes. It'll work fine for cooling. Basically, we're on either side of the evaporator coil right there. There's my nice A coil indicator. But head outside to start everything up out there breakers off right now with the disconnect. So I'm going to hook everything else up and start it up and see how we look. Let me get some airflow from this return grill and the one on the opposite side. So using pleated filters as you can see here. See how much drag they have, how far it's pulled back in there. And this is an older grill. See it has closer fin spacings than a newer grill would have. So there's less free area. On a newer grill I use .68 68% free area on grill size. On these, I'll use 0.6, so it's a little bit lower. All right, I'm gonna get my CFM measurements, and we'll input them into the I manifold to see what it says. I have 557 and 564 
on the first grill, which is a 16 by 25. So we will be using 560 for our estimation. We'll add it to the other grill. What do you say? Good idea? Well, we got our numbers from the 14 by 20 grill here. Uh, we're averaging around 240. So with our 560 and our 240, that puts us at 800. For three and a half tons, we should be at around 1400. That ain't good. Here's our tonnages and pressures right now. We have a three and a half ton machine. As you see, we're running closer to three tons. That is because of our airflow. Our airflow, I, I put it in as 880, giving the ductwork a 10% air loss because it is in bad shape. Now, if that got any lower, of course, the tonnage would get lower. But right now, our split is high. That's why our air handler is filled with mold and crap because it's so there's so much humidity inside of that air handler and sweating. It's just going to cause issue after issue. I'm surprised the ECM motor is not dead yet, but it's not. It's still going strong. As soon as it does die, it's going to be a death knell for the system because uh, it just it needs to be overhauled completely. But you guys can sort of see the effects of having uh, a low airflow in the system right there. Now the, the pressure on the suction side is staying relatively high. I don't know if that's due to the TXV being in place, but it's actually not as low as you would think it would be. But our efficiency is definitely low. One thing I'll have to look up on this train unit is the fact that it's a TWE 040 and our unit outside is a three and a half ton unit. I have to make sure that they are actually a compatible pair. Um, a lot of times when you have an outdoor unit, your air handler will not be a smaller nominal size. It'll be a larger, like you'll match it with the TWE 049 or something like that, but I have to look it up. It's possible that explains some of our crazy pressures. I don't, I don't know. It's too old for me to remember offhand uh, if it's a match or not, but I'll look it up. Like uh, I'm sure they'll rip it out as soon as I tell them it's not a match. <laughs> Another thing worth noticing is you see our supply air dry bulb is 44.6 degrees and our supply air relative humidity is 95.4 percent. The reason those two numbers are the way they are is because of the airflow. Uh, the lower the airflow, uh, the lower the temperature is going to be on the exit side of the supply. And the lower the temperature is, the, the smaller the air spaces is the contained water. And therefore you have a higher relative humidity. That's why you have sweating problems in air handlers with low airflow and it causes the circuit boards to go bad. We've discussed it in the past. But it's a problem and it's one of the reasons why things on the supply side like the ECM motors uh, will take a beating if that's the case. Not only are they trying to ramp up to get the proper airflow, they have all that moisture to contend with and that can cause them issues as well. If you notice on a lot of ECM motors now, they're sealed up so moisture can't get inside of the uh, module. So this will be where this one stays, guys. Not perfect at all, but what are you going to do? Tell them what the problem is so they can ignore it or take care of it. And hopefully they'll ignore it because sooner or later uh, it'll be brought to their attention in a more urgent manner. We've been